Looks like we're live, Mitch. <gasps> oh, no. Live. You ready to start the show, man? I better start the dang clock. Clock's going. And in five, four, three, two. <laughs> Hello and welcome back to another exciting episode of DSLR Film New Podcast. Mitch from Planet 5 b joins me today to discuss all kinds of stuff. We've got a lot of things going on and it's early in the morning for both of us. But first, Mitch, what have you been up to, man? I'm doing all sorts of great stuff, DJ. Thanks for having me on yet again on another wonderful episode of the DSLR Film New Podcast. I'm so thrilled to be here. It's Friday. I've got a week and a half till my hernia surgery. Woohoo! Oh my gosh. Really? Yeah. It's been working on it for a while. It's oh. my second one too, by the way. So I must be prone. Yeah. You do the show from the bed, like just like this laying down. No, the surgery is on Monday, the 28th. So I should be plenty fine by Friday. How long does it take to recover from something like that? It's only a couple of days. Oh, well, best of luck, my friend. Going hey. under the knife is always scary. Yeah, well, this one's not too bad, so. On my end, I've Better continued Sorry. to be editing off and on. Um, almost done, though. The window of opportunity is approaching. Uh, we just finished scene 56 of 85 scenes, so <laughs> I will soon be done editing every single night. Uh, also got a few reviews posted. Uh, I would like to take this moment to thank Devin. He did some Audio Technica reviews as well as some Asden reviews for me on the site. Uh, those are also on the YouTube channel, so be sure to check those out. But we've got a lot to cover, Mitch, so I think it's probably time for the news. Time for the news. Time for the news. Time for the news. Still got some IBC stuff trickling in here. And one of the things I wanted to bring up is actually this new brand of Flex Light. This is the Brightcast. And it's basically a flexible LED light. But the take on this is actually it's got a wireframe around it that allows you to hold the position as you flex the light. Now, the pricing on this looks to be about $200 US and $199 in Europe. Uh, that's not a bad price with an adjustable uh, color temperature of between 3200 and 5600 and compared to some of the competition out there the flex options are in the thousand dollar range. This looks pretty affordable. Mitch what do you think about flex light LED systems? Uh, well I still have the one that I have from Westcott. There's, where's my plug? There it is. Uh, it's it's awesome. It looks very similar to the one that's in the picture in the show notes. Uh, I guess this is where I put on my defensive manufacturer's hat and say, well, ripoffs are bad because this looks like a ripoff, right? Uh, yeah, it could be actually. Um, not sure how much IP is behind something like this. Uh, I'm guessing they print the LEDs onto a flex plastic surface and then run. Uh, conductive wire through the back of that. Um, not 100% sure how this compares to the Westcott because I haven't seen it. Mitch is holding that up right now. I'll select I'll him. Up the box. Um, I don't now, know. does the Westcott unit use a wireframe to hold its shape? Um, well, no. And that's what's maybe potentially curious about that because. I mean, it's bendable, right? The whole point yeah. is it's flexible and bendable, and I mean, it, it looks it looks almost identical from the picture that you have there in the show notes. But so you can put it inside a frame if you want, but obviously when you want it bent, you want it to bend and hold its shape. So I, I just assume they're using the same kind of technology in there, but I since I don't see any video to know, uh, yeah, but the, it's cheaper because the other one, the Westcott's about 500 bucks. So I think, yeah, the one I have linked to in the show notes from Westcott was a thousand dollars. I was looking around to see if there's any cheaper models, but that's the one by one square here with like a, a little stand and plate. 
Uh, the flexible technology is sort of interesting. I do like the idea that you can bend it around. Um, I don't know, I'm kind of always concerned about the light output of these sorts of devices because LED in general doesn't have a lot of throw. And then you spread it out onto a flexible sheet. Are you really going to cover a lot of uh, area with something like this unless you get really close to your subject matter? It, it does a pretty decent job. Uh, you've got to manage it like you do any other thing. It's not as bright, obviously, as a just a full panel or like a Cineo light. Have you ever seen the Cineo lights? Only at NAB. Okay. Um, you know, those things are dadgum bright. They're practically blinding. Uh, so uh, this obviously isn't that bright. And that kit that you have linked in the show notes obviously has a whole lot of extras that the one that I have doesn't. Because I think this is this kit that's in this box is is just the light and you don't have all those extra frames and all that other stuff. And and I believe the pricing on this is about 500 bucks. So either way, it's still much more than the $200 that you found in that particular knockoff. Now, I got a question for you on that Westcott. Uh, do you use an external power source? Is it just a, a cord that comes out of there? Or uh, how do you power that thing? Yeah, it's got... it's. I still have it in the box. Um, it's it's got a battery, I mean a power cord to it, and a power supply and a dimmer switch. Uh, so I mean, you can run it off a of battery, obviously, if you need to, but it has a it it's basically powered to the wall. So more news trickling in at the IBC conference here, and actually, I'm going to skip one thing, which is the show lead, and go to the <laughs> Canon ME20F before we talk about the Panasonic hack. But uh, we've basically got some new images in and some new video in from the ME20F, and I believe that's the dash SH. Thanks, Canon, for your wonderful naming schemes. Uh, Mitch here was kind enough to post this in the show notes. These are shots of 4,560,000 ISO. Uh, that's not 400,000, that's 4 million. Uh, basically, these guys are grainy as heck, but you can vaguely make out colors in this. Uh, I did find it interesting that these shots are of zebras, which lack much in the way of color. Uh, Mitch, what do you think about Canon's $30,000 low light monster? Well, I think it's an awesome video if you, well, okay, re, let me rephrase that. It's an interesting video where they demonstrate the usage of this in multiple environments. Uh, I'm sure you didn't have enough time to go through it because it just popped up to me uh, this morning and you just crawled out of bed because I know you're so early over there. Anyway. They show several different environments underwater. Uh, the wa underwater one is fairly impressive because they do it in moonlight. Uh, it's, again, like this. It's very grainy, and there's not a whole lot to see in the particular sample underwater. But the fact that you can take a camera underwater and see some things in only moonlight in the ocean is pretty significant now they obviously were not going down very deeply because that would tend to block off all light it would get pretty dadgum dark really fast uh but they showed some industrial settings and i i think it'd be really cool dj because you've got the a7s which you've played with in really dark environments oh, and yeah um, they show several things that are at iso twenty five thousand that have just a hint of noise, uh, but I haven't really sat down and compared it to the A7S at 25,000. So I'd be I'd be really curious to see sort of a direct comparison. Uh, obviously, you don't have the ME 20 SH blah F whatever or 20 F. I don't have thirty thousand dollars to throw away on experimental Canon cameras. I did manage to watch the entire video. Uh, it actually showed up in my feed late last night around 11 o'clock. And the underwater scene, did you see that section where they're shooting uh, some kind of glowing creature on right. the bottom of the water? I mean, 
that's really interesting that they're able to do that. And one thing uh, that was also interesting is to see that the uh, camera was actually a little bit abused. Uh, there was chunks of paint minute missing and stuff like that. They've actually been taking this out and really giving it a whirl. Now, one thing that stood out for me in the underwater case shot is before they put it in the case, you'll notice along the side of the camera, there is a large heat sink slash vent port. Yeah. And uh, that's like cut out of the side of the box on the ME20F-SH. And I'm wondering how well it will do with heat dissipation in some kind of enclosure like that. Because if they're pushing the sensor as hard as they are to get down to 4 million plus ISO, I'm sure they're going to be generating quite a bit of heat from that imaging sensor as they push it that hard. Do you think the enclosure will be a problem and that's why they only went to mild depths as opposed to really deep yeah. into the ocean? Well, I don't know if it's about a heat issue. I'm, I do know that the farther down you go, the water blocks out more and more light. So I suspect that you can't go really very far. But I was... I was also very fascinated by the size of that vent on the side of that. Um, uh, the reason I bring that up is actually the C100 and C300 both had fan assist cooling right. built in. And those aren't nearly as low light a beast as this particular guy. And uh, the fan noise was somewhat irritating for myself and a few others. Uh, imagine this uh, blowing hot air out at you as you film. Yeah. And and I was wasn't have you seen the the F five the Sony F five that was announced last week? Didn't it have a fairly significant vent on the side as well? You know what? Now I got to bring up a picture to find out the uh, Sony FS five. I looked at the camera, but I don't remember seeing a huge vent on there. Maybe I'm confused. It's quite possible that I'm confused. Really surprised? Yes, it's true. Okay, I'm looking right now, and I'll share my screen with you guys so you can get an idea of what this looks like here i am not seeing a big vent okay on this guy so yeah, apparently they've managed to keep cooling somewhat under control that, oh, see, hold on what is this right here say, is what, that, a, that right there looks like a fairly big vent opening yeah that could be mitch that could be a vent opening um, I'm not 100% sure. It looks like that might be a battery adapter of some kind, though, because uh, here it is without that particular unit. Right. And if there's going to be a vent on here, usually it would be in the sensor range right. back here. So I'm guessing no major vent on the FS5. Cool. I oh, cool. <laughs> Bad pun. Uh <laughs> I was just, by the way, throwing in numbers because I was con con cons not concerned. Oh, it's it's Friday, isn't it? Four hundred and two thousand is the ISO highest ISO on the Sony F. God, sorry, the A7S, right? Four hundred two something. Yeah, uh, four hundred thousand range is where you cap out on the uh, Sony A7S. So if you if you start doubling, right? Because ISOs double with one stop right so 402 would go to 804 and 804 would go to 1.6 million and then that would double the uh, uh 30 3 3 million 200,000 right okay so million i'm trying to get to 4 million 5 what they're doing and so so that's like one to three and a half stops more than the a7s really because we, what what blows my mind is I mean we we suddenly start talking about four point five million ISO, which seems like an incredibly big deal, right? Because it's such a huge number. But the way the ISOs double with every stop, we're really only talking about three and a half stops more than the A7S, right? Very true. Uh, okay. Also, I would argue that the A7S, while really good in low light, and I looked to find the top ISO, it's a uh, 409600. Uh, right. So it's um, it's not really good up to that level. I right. would say it's good, to, you know, somewhere in the the 100 ISO or 100,000 ISO range. After that, it just falls apart. And I'm guessing uh, the ME 
uh, 20F is the same way where it uh, it probably has the maximum of four million and some change, but in reality, maybe half of that ISO. So one stop lower than that would be where it's not so grainy or you know however many stops below that. Uh, I guess I wonder, you know, even though they provide these maximum numbers, are they really realistic out in the world shooting? What would you want to shoot besides these wildlife scenes or maybe a possible reality show that you would want to push it that far with only moonlight? I I think that's very true. Security would obviously want to have something that is... Uh, shooting at night for security purposes however i tend to think based on what i've seen with this if i could use a night vision thing there's a lot less noise in most of the night vision video that i've seen even though it's a green color right than yeah. than what you see here so they did say in the press releases that they were looking at some extreme usages like nature people who are out there trying to study zebras or whatever so that they could get some non-night vision video of these creatures in real life but i think at the same point uh, i mean <laughs> i'm not going to be watching that for very long with those the picture of the zebra and by the way that clip right there of where i where i extracted these screen grabs is at two minutes and 55 seconds in the video and right at that point, you can see the ramping up because they obviously have it on auto ISO because they're in this nature area with lighting and then they turn the lighting off. So they're at like 25,000 ISO and they turn the lighting off and then the camera ramps up. So you can see or it's only like a second or two where the camera is changing the ISO. And so you can get this idea of how quickly it falls apart in that one little segment and it falls apart very quickly. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to have to go back and rewatch that. Now you got me interested in that sort of thing. I wonder, you know, for security, if this camera isn't way too expensive though, because yeah. uh, you know, honestly you can get a security camera with the uh, infrared uh, lighted or light around the outside. So you can't see it with your own eye, but that illuminates subjects enough to, you know, figure out who they are and what they're up to. Uh, right. $30,000 installation, you better have a very important item that you need to protect in low light yeah. in order to justify a camera like this. Yeah. And, and, and if you were to try to show some of this video that's, that's at this 4 million range on naked and afraid, I think people would go, ah. So now I, I guess... As a horror movie uh, filmmaker, um, I, I've needed low light performance a few times, and and it's actually not that bad to have really heavy grain. Uh, there's been times where that sort of experience kind of adds to the stylization of that section, and you find yourself adding a little more of that sort of dark noise. Um, you don't do it very often, but there are times when it's uh, an effective way to work with actors and so on and i imagine this you know if you had the camera in front of someone's face and it's so dark that they can't see but the camera can see them and you're not getting that weird scary you know white glowing eye thing from uh, an ir emitting diode you know it, it could be a an interesting ploy i suppose i could see renting that out a few times for a shoot or something you know uh yeah i don't think lens pro to go or somebody's gonna buy this sucker at thirty thousand dollars to rent very often no. well they might have one if we're lucky that they'll rent you for you know four thousand or five thousand dollars a day. week a day yeah uh remember when the red packages uh, the original red one, I think uh, base package is going to set you back about 40000 And I think it was only $4,700 a week to rent a red package back then. So not completely unreasonable to think that we could get these for, you know, yeah. uh, three or $4,000 a week. But this camera yeah. is probably out of most of our price ranges. Wouldn't you agree, Mitch? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, once I get my second business going full steam, man, I'm going to be living on the beach and I could buy three of these just for fun. <laughs> now, we've talked about cameras. Let's talk about a big camera mistake. Uh, Panasonic jumped into the uh, selling the firmware pool and charged everybody $99 for the latest upgrade to add vlog to the Panasonic GH4. Well, it looks like they made a mistake. Uh, no. I mentioned this before when we were talking about it, uh, that they were pre-ordering for this and that I'm sure something will go wrong. And that's why they're pushing pre-order so much. Well, it turns out if you load the version 2.3 firmware to your GH4 and you use the phone app to connect, you can actually set up a vlog in your GH4 as a custom preset so that you have access to it without paying $99. Now, in a Panasonic statement, they did mention that they would be removing this uh, from the cameras. Any cameras that are sent in will have it removed, and a vlog workaround would be sort of clamped down on. Mitch, what do you think about charging for firmware? I know we've talked a little bit about this, but also this big mistake Panasonic has made in selling their firmware and yet giving it away for free. Well, I went on a tirade, what was it? Today's Friday, Wednesday when I heard about this, somebody pinged me on Facebook, sent me an instant message uh, and said that I really needed to post it very quickly. And I did a little bit of looking into it, and I have a problem with ethics on this one um, because mainly people were jumping in and saying, oh, we're getting this $99 thing for free. It's great. Let's go basically go get this. And, and I put a word of warning over on the GH4 Facebook group and said, ethically, this is not the right thing to be doing. Uh, if you walked into a camera store with the $99 camera lens sitting on the counter and there no, was nobody was watching and it's right by the door, are you going to put it in your pocket and walk out? The answer is no. Nobody's going to do that. I don't necessarily agree that Panasonic should be charging for this firmware. I think, you know, the precedent has been set that they should be giving it away. But they made the choice to sell it. And if that's the choice that was made, you have to honor it as an ethical, honest person. You have to put on your honesty hat and say, okay, they've made a mistake. I'm not going to go get it because I am i wouldn't go looting if the somebody broke in the window of the store down the street. So why is it okay? Why is it okay for people to go, oh, now I can get this for free. Panasonic is giving it away now. It's just not right. Don't do it. Now, as DJ pointed out, and uh, no film school has posted about it, I refuse to post about it on Planet 5D because I just, I don't think it's right. It, yes, it's a mistake. Is it a news item? I don't, I, I don't know. I still don't think I would post it because it bothers me that the, the mentality of people today is that, oh, if I can get it, if I can get it for free, then I should have it. And it's just not right. It's just like stealing music. It's just like stealing other stuff that people, Panasonic obviously thought they needed to get some money out of this. And so they're charging for it. You should either pay for it or not use it. Now, no. if, if you're going to, if you're going to pay for it and it hasn't been delivered and this gives you the opportunity to, to try it out, that's okay. And, and you've paid for it. That's fine. You're going to pay for it. That's great. Go ahead. I but, see. I think a little bit differently about this one. Since people aren't breaking in and hacking the camera specifically, Panasonic actually released this to the public, handed it out to everybody, and then slapped their forehead when they realized that the gift bag they sent out also ended up having uh, some higher ticket items in the gift bag, and they can't, you know, no take backs. So, as opposed to being a theft sort of thing, this is more like. I downloaded all the stuff Panasonic gave me, and I just so happened to get this extra stuff that they didn't intend to give me, but they gave me anyway. You're not stealing from them. You're benefiting from, uh, you know, this is like when you go to the, the Walmart machine that hands out dollars, and you get like five bucks extra that you're not supposed to get, but it gave it to you. 
do you go up to the clerk and say, hey, this machine gave me five extra dollars? Or do you say, yeah. well, I got five extra dollars out of this machine. Thanks, machine. I, I don't know if it's right. I'm, I'm not trying to, if, to if justify Walmart- stealing from anybody. But when the company messes up and gives you extra stuff, I mean, that's kind of their fault, right? Shouldn't they have had a little more Q, uh, quality control on that? Uh, yes, absolutely. They should have a little bit more quality control. Um, if the machine at Walmart gave you $99 versus 5 wouldn't you be a little bit more wanting to go over and hand it in? Yes. The right ethical answer is yes, you would go hand that in. I personally had, agree. I would give the money back, but we had this debate the other day at a, at a party with a group of friends and, and somebody said, well, if you found $200 on the street that, you know, somebody had probably dropped, would you turn it in? And, you know, I mean, it, there's all sorts of scenarios, but I'm like, and, he, and he's like, well, if it's $200, I'm keeping it. Well, it's, maybe that's somebody, that's their monthly allotment for food. You know, I, you know, anyway, I, I just have ethical issues with it. And I understand your viewpoint that it's, it was a mistake. But at the same, part, at the same time, the right thing to do would be to not use it. That's my opinion. And I'm sticking to it. Now, there are some caveats for those of you who are looking to upgrade your camera. Um, I've got a link in the show notes, and this does not in any way uh, show Mitch's approval of this. But uh, you can head over to the Reddit thread if you want to check out where to get a copy of the old firmware that Panasonic has removed. The caveats for this are that basically your Zebra functionality is iffy as well as your histogram readout. So be aware of those two things. Also, you're going to want to shoot a little bit on the overexposed side to get the best performance out of this because this is not the official vlog. This is the unofficial vlog. Uh, I am not endorsing or you know condoning or condemning this. Do whatever you want. It's your camera. But if you do send your camera into Panasonic, they will flash it and upgrade to version 2.4. So keep that in mind if you are trying to take advantage of this $99 benefit. Uh, otherwise, I mean, it's kind of weird that Panasonic would make such a very easy to find a mistake in their firmware and phone apps, man, yeah. guys get on the ball. If you're going to sell something, you know, make sure you put your paywall up nice and solid. Otherwise people are going to find holes in your armor. Now moving on down the line to holes in the armor. I know Mitch and I have talked about storage before and he's complained heavily about Drobo and their proprietary settings. Well, I've actually jumped in to Yay. the Drobo camp. This is the lid. Of course, the rest of the unit is over here. But I ended up with about five giant portable hard drives. They're the USB 3 flavor. And they were all sitting around with a bunch of data on it. And I was starting to get frustrated with all those drives being all over my desk, taking up space, everything else. So what I did, it's called drive shucking. And I'll grab the drive case you can see. Drive shucking, there is a new term. Yeah, so drive shucking is basically, if you have these drives, here is what's left of the enclosures here. You can simply take these apart. I've got uh, directions at dslrfilmnoob.com on how to separate your drives from these. And you can buy these uh, for a little bit cheaper than you can the regular drives. That wasn't actually my intent. I just ended up with a bunch of these. And I wanted to put them in one location. Well, Mitch complained uh, before about Drobo in general and the slow read and write speeds. That was with the older generations. Uh, The USB 3.0 four bay unit that I've got now, uh, still not maxing out uh, USB 3.0, but it's providing about 200 meg read and 200 meg write, which is roughly double the speed that you would get out of a standalone hard drive. And I was able to turn four of these into one of those so now i have less junk laying around minus this junk of course which i i don't know what i'm gonna do with does anybody want a shuck to drive <laughs> shuck, 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 shuck. is there a recycling uh facility close to you for electronics yeah there's no um actual rhos parts in here all it is is uh a metal guard plate. If you look, and I think I've got it laying here somewhere on my desk, the bottom base plate. Yep, here it is right here. 
it, it all it is actually is a little piece that you can plug into any SATA device and transfer it to USB 3.0 with a power plug. So I'm going to actually save this and I was testing it out here. I'm going to reach over and grab that as well. Drive sucking. Huh? <laughs> okay, this is kind of clever here. I broke the tabs off of one of them, which these tabs right here are what lock the drive into place. And this is a Blu-ray drive. And I was able to simply plug it into the back of the Blu-ray drive and Ooh. turn this empty case into a USB 3.0 powered USB uh, Blu-ray drive. So that's it's kind of kind of interesting that it works that way. I mean, this is sort of handy. It's a little wonky. Obviously, this is not the most solid design in the world, but yeah. There's some applause for that one. <laughs> You're so, a true noob. Experimentation, man. But I will say uh, 250 is what I paid for the Drobo uh, four bay unit. That's a pretty reasonable price for uh, that kind of simple, easy to use storage. Uh, they've come way down in price and man, this was one of the easiest storage setups i've ever had you know you just plug it in click a couple buttons and it's done i i, I want to go back and say that i don't have a problem with drobo and their proprietariness i love the fact that you can hard uh, or uh, god brain come on you can swap the drives in and out without having to power down and do all that other stuff and all the times that you've talked about nas storage and and uh, all the other fancy, uh, my words are not coming to me today, uh, things that you have to set up to do RAID and all that other crap. The Drobo is awesome to be able to just plug it, turn it on, shove some drives in it, and it works. Now, the two that I have, and, and I have one sitting here on my floor that I had up on eBay, by the way, uh, and... Turns out I lost the power cord. I cannot find the dang power cord for the thing because it's been in my room for a long time unused. And the one thing that drives me the most bonkers, two things, sound, the fan sound of the Drobo. I don't know what your new one is like, but the old ones are, are loud. And the fact that the, if you don't have the right frickin' power cord, they don't work. And it's kind of amazing. You can, you can get it to power up, but if it's not the exact ample, uh, uh, amps, if it's not 6.6 .6 volts, which is the one the one I have on the floor uses, if it's 6.4, it just constantly cycles with power. You have to have the exact right cord. <laughs> and so anyway, I can't sell this one because I don't have the right cord. I'll have to check on the unit once I get a chance to dig around behind my desk. But uh, it looked to be very similar, if not the same, uh, power ratings as a couple of my USB 3.0 hubs. So it may be identical. I'll double check the amperage and voltage and get back to you on that. As for volume, uh, it's much quieter than the uh, 40 terabyte system that I have back here i actually shut that off for the show uh that unit right there is uh fairly loud because there's so many dang hard drives shoved yeah, into a single box um this room's already a little noisy as is with fan noise and i have to choose what's on and off when i'm doing the show this guy though it's quieter than the desktop that's sitting next to me so I think they've done a good job with it. Really simple to use. Very nice design. I like the cute little magnetic cover. And 200 meg per second read-write speeds. So that's enough to use this as basically a replacement for all those drives that I shucked and put into the case. So Next so, 12 terabytes, not bad. Yeah, it's nice. And I like I said, I do like the Drobos. Uh, there are some people who have had problems with them and badmouth them because... But once they go bad, they go bad. So obviously, with as with anything else, you want to back those that up. I am using my current, the Drobo that's underneath my desk is a backup for the main drive on my computer. So that's all I'm using it for right now is a backup system. 
Now, one thing I will say for those of you who are looking for all the speed, I did put two one terabyte SSDs in here and test read write speeds, and it's still locked up at about 200 meg read and write. So, huh. yeah, you're not, if you are planning to build some kind of super fast read write array with SSDs, uh, Drobo's probably not the way to go. Even their really skinny laptop hard drive unit uh, runs a software RAID array and the processor speed and the software implementation are actually what ends up limiting your read write speeds to the to the unit itself as opposed to the speed available from say your SSD drives or your spinning drives or whatever. So keep that in mind if that's your end goal. Uh, as far as spinning drives go, you know, getting 200 uh, plus out of this is that's ex more than acceptable for me. That's enough to back up stuff, uh, move stuff off of main drives and uh, collect files into a big chunk yep. and seamless, easy implementation. Plus Mitch, absolutely right. Always back up guys, uh, have something, even if it's not the super fastest to have your stuff backed up to, or you could lose your footage. Now on to something a little more fun, Mitch, what do you want to talk about with this Canon Expo? I know you've had a ton of coverage over at Planet 5D. Uh, interviews, uh, full tour of the facilities. What's going on over there? Well, first, since since we've opened up the opportunity, you know what yesterday was, right? September 7th? Uh, no. What was yesterday? Oh, the yes. Okay. It was the yeah. anniversary of the release of the 5D Mark two. That's the fastest sound bite I have. So and great, it's, it's not the right one, but woohoo, that's right. The 5D Mark II was announced seven years ago yesterday. Holy which is cow. pretty significant if you ask me. I mean, I all of our writers have written something. We had two, three posts yesterday and three posts today about the anniversary and what it has meant to each individual person. Uh, it's just sort of a thing. When I saw the anniversary was coming up, I said, hey, guys, you guys want to write something? Maybe a couple of paragraphs. <laughs> uh, so I said, and I was and I was serious. I told them, you know, don't spend more than 20, 30 minutes writing something. And they all wrote this long treatise. <laughs> it was like a thousand words about what the 5D has done or where they think we're going in the future. And so we ended up publishing six different posts which was a lot more than what I was originally intending. But, you know, the 5D certainly was a game changer, to use that quote that everybody hates, uh, the phrase, the pays, I don't know. And things have changed. So I did a long story yesterday about where I think we're going in the future. So check that out over at planet5d.com. And about the expo, I really was kind of sad last week when it was going on because I I enjoyed the expo that I went to in 2010. It's a lot of fun. There's there's and Hugh, Hugh was in he lives in Philadelphia and he went to New York to to see the expo. And he was like, there's no way that this is going to be worth two days of my time. And I was like, Hugh, <laughs> yes it will. You'll be surprised when you get there. And if you go in and watch the video that he did, uh, which we posted this morning, he was very surprised. The Canon put on one hell of a show. There was a whole lot of technology there from the 4 million sensor. The camera body was there. Uh, the one or the 250 megapixel sensor was there with a live demo. They had an entire baseball field set up for shooting things with C300, C100s, and all sorts of cameras and lenses. And they had baseball players playing. It wasn't a full field, but it was pretty daggum impressive. Uh, printers, security systems, all kinds of wacky stuff. And Hugh sat down with Chuck Westfall for 30 minutes and had a fascinating conversation with Chuck, where they talked about some very interesting things, including the sensors and the bodies and where Chuck thinks Canon's going. But as a nugget that came out of that, I want to talk about STM, you know, the STM lens focusing system that they have. Uh, 
Interestingly enough, Chuck talks about the fact that the motors inside STM lenses are not, at this point, they're not able to drive the larger lenses, which is why we have not seen STM hit the, the bigger zooms, the heavier lenses, because there's a lot of glass in there that has to be moved around. Uh, so I thought that was an interesting tidbit. Uh, they talked about whether or not lenses are going to be compatible with 4K and 8K. And it's, it's as I expected, it was a fascinating time. There's a heck of a lot of technology that Canon has that they're putting out. And if you go, by the way, if you had been. Oh, and, and they also have a new, uh, I just got a press release just before the show. They actually have an online version where you can see some of this stuff, and I will post that on Planet 5D, of course, and we'll I'll add it to the show notes uh, because I haven't, I don't know exactly where the link sends us yet. I was too busy prepping for the show, but Canon spends a boatload of money on that expo. They rent the entire Javits Hall for, you know, two days of exhibits, but they also have to do a heck of a lot of setup and hiring people like baseball players. They had real life baseball players there to do this baseball thing. Wow. They spend a lot of money on it and they do, uh, they also do it in Paris and they've added a version for Shanghai this year. So they're doing it huh. in China. And so they're taking this show to Europe and beyond and it costs them a boatload of money to put this show on. I don't know. It's a lot. Anyway, there's my I wanted to address two things uh, with uh, that particular round of conversation. The, first of all, the 5D Mark II, I'm looking on eBay right now, still fetches in the $800 range and is still advertised as a good filmmaking tool. Uh, Magic Lantern has opened up tons of features for that camera. And I know people are talking about how the trend is away from DSLRs as a general rule for filmmaking, but... The 5D Mark II is still a very valid tool for you guys to film on, and it works great. Also on the STM motors, uh, for those of you not familiar with the technology, that's a stepper motor. Uh, before Canon's lenses used USM, which is ultrasonic motors, uh, basically one is a step controller similar to what you see in motor drivers for industrial applications. Uh, because it has to energize two coils in order to move the shaft from one position to the other or move the lens in this case from one position to the other, it takes quite a bit more current to accomplish that and therefore more windings. And more windings means more space. So they may be dealing with a physics issue if they want to move STM to bigger glass which would give you uh you know better f-stops you're not going to be dealing with f2.8 if you can move a lot of glass you'll be able to crank it down to f1.4 or something sexy i knew like that something about this technology gosh you know everything dj absolutely everything motor drivers are my forte man i can yeah. tell you about pwm and stm and all the other fancy m's that are out there now something i do not know as much about but is very interesting is the genius variable nd filter this is let me show you guys what they're doing here they're basically using the same technology you probably are familiar with in your calculator that shows you the numbers in order to make translucent or less translucent a layer, thereby giving you a variable ND filter that is 100% electronic. Now, we've got some pictures here in the show notes. These are prototypes from what I understand, Mitch. Is that correct? Right. This was coverage from... Um newshooter.com which used to be dslr news shooter dan chong and his crew did a, an amazing job like tj said before the show i mean they've got thousands of posts i swear about ibc and this was shown by genus it's genus by the way you oh genus i'm sorry not uh genius <laughs> not genius it is genius but uh, i do think it's fascinating and, and and dan chong pointed out in the video where they do the demo and the interview you know, this technology is brand new to the Sony FS5, uh, which was just announced last week. But the ability to add an external unit, 
uh, like Aperture and Metabones and some of the other guys have done, uh, is going to be fairly cool. It's going to allow you to have a variable ND for DSLRs and mirrorless that was not available before. And this is going to be pretty significant technology. Uh, I don't know the pricing yet of, of this from Genesis, obviously. Uh, but the, it, by the way, it's not just a variable ND because it also does all the other electronics of these adapters like the Metabones and the, the one from Aperture. Uh, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a box over the corner where I have the, the Aperture DEC prototype that we talked about on the show. Uh, so it's going to have all the electronics besides the variable ND, and that just makes it really cool. Yeah, this is a interesting tech. I do wonder, though, because uh, these are designed specifically to go in between something like a GH4 and a Canon lens where you have that gap, how this will work out for uh, Canon native glass on Canon cameras. Uh, I don't know that you'll be able to squeeze something like that in there. Uh, the other thing that concerns me with a design like this is actually what's it doing to your image? Um, this is an extra layer that you're putting in there. It is on uh, the other end of the lens, but uh, it may soften or add some other effects that are yet to be seen. Uh, I would like to see something like this actually manufactured and added to the chip layer. Uh, that would be really nice to see. I'm not sure if that's what they're doing exactly on the Sony FS5, but that's my assumption. I, I wouldn't think that they would put it further out if if possible, it'd be easier to install that as an extra layer on top of the sensor, which would probably provide a little bit better image quality overall. Uh, it's still really cool tech. Definitely right. worth looking into. And newshooter.com, man, every booth at IBC, it seems like they were at <laughs> interviewing, talking to, and so on. I mean, uh, inadvertently, I think even that video I posted at the very beginning of the show notes uh, from... Uh, Brightcast is actually on their Vimeo channel. So be sure to swing over there for all the IBC coverage because they're doing a fantastic job. Now, last thing on the show notes here. Right. Time out. Oh. I do, before we go on, uh, I wanted to mention, by the way, something that I found missing from Canon Expo. And, and I wish uh, Hugh had asked Chuck Westfall about it, but there was no mention of any kind of uh, sensor stabilization, 5-axis, 3-axis, or anything else that we've been hearing from Sony and the other guys. So I, I found it interesting that it was missing. Don't mm. know what that means yet, but there was no conversation about that whatsoever. Uh, one other thing, I now you got me thinking about it, uh, that I wanted to mention is I've noticed a lot of lens reviewers now reviewing Canon Glass that they've reviews and reviewed in the past only using the 5DS and then commenting on the resolution and the resolving power of those lenses based on that higher megapixel count. Um, right. I wonder how that will reflect 4K shooting in the future as well as uh, lenses with, uh, you know, sitting on camera bodies that have 40, 50, 60 megapixel sensors on there. Uh, it's interesting to see which lenses stand up. And the 40 millimeter F2.8 pancake is actually. I was just looking at a review, and I unfortunately can't remember which site it was on. Um, hold on. Dang it, DJ. I should have written this down. I didn't That's even right. know I was going to this place. Uh, <laughs> the digitalpicture.com has a nice review using uh, the 40 millimeter F2.8 Canon Pancake on the 5DS. So swing over there and check that out. I'll see if I can't get that into the show notes. But uh, it is really interesting to see uh, these sorts of tests with the higher megapixel count and how the lenses look in 4K. I mean, Mitch, what do you think? Were these were these lenses ever going to make it up to that high of a megapixel without causing some sort of image degradation? I think it's a very fascinating conversation that you ought to go listen to what Chuck Westfall has to say, by the way, about that, because he was specifically asked that question about 4K. I believe, and I have—I don't know that I've seen it, or maybe I have seen it and certainly don't remember where it is, but Canon is, I think, has a chart of which lenses they believe are 4K compatible. 
and they are even working on a list of those lenses that are 8K compatible because God knows we're going that direction. Significantly, though, they Chuck Westall, I believe, says that, and I, I don't have the exact quote from him because I, I didn't write it down and memorize it from the video, but he does specifically address that. Uh, the vast majority of their lenses are 4K compatible, according to Chuck. I don't remember nice. the number or whatever, but that was his answer to that question. Okay, good. I haven't had a chance to watch the entire interview. Um, I got like 15 minutes in and was just mesmerized by the uh, uh, Expo Center and all the cool stuff they had there. So then I had to go do something else. Um, yeah. Okay, last thing on the show notes before we get out of here. And this is kind of something that's more in my side of the fence than Mitch's. But it does look like uh, Medicon, who's given us some fairly... Uh, large aperture lenses has released a competitor to the Voigtlander 25 millimeter f0.95. Uh, instead of being $800, this is going to be $399. The design looks nice. The packaging looks beautiful, uh, but I'm not sure if this will stand up to the quality that you get out of something like the Voigtlander 25 millimeter F 0.95. Now, if you've looked into any of the Medicon lenses that have been released, uh, they've been well received, but corner sharpness is usually somewhat of an issue. And uh, the color that comes out of them is usually a little bit interesting uh, to say the least. Those aren't bad things, but if you are looking for a cheaper alternative to the Voigtlander 25 millimeter F 0.95. This is an option. Uh, they're going to start showing up on eBay probably next month, and they're right now fulfilling pre-orders. I've always been really attracted to their Sony 50 millimeter lens. I don't know if you've ever seen that, Mitch. <laughs> no, I I frankly have never heard of Miticon. I apologize. Okay, well, uh, I'll sh I'll bring this up real quick. It's really super sexy. Uh, Miticon sells a Sony E-mount lens. It's manual focus, of course, but this guy is a full-frame 50 millimeter 0 0.95 f-stop lens for about 849. And uh, I mean, the the Sony A7S can already shoot in the dark. Now put an f 0 0.95 aperture lens in front of it. And my gosh, you can just put the hairs on someone's forehead in focus <laughs> only and leave the rest of their body out of the equation. It, it's really sexy. Uh, fun lens, kind of on my want but no don't need list. Uh, and th the same complaints were common with other lenses of this ilk. Uh, the infamous Canon 50 millimeter F 1.0 had issues with both focusing as well as sharpness in the corners. I think part of the problem is getting down to uh, that large of an aperture opening. You, you tend to get to the very edge of the glass and it's probably hard in the manufacturing process to get things as high a quality with uh, that many elements. And then on top of that, trying to squeeze it into a price factor of 399 or 849 and so on. What's the 50 millimeter F10 run, Mitch? Isn't that like five thousand uh, dollars? yeah, sure. Yeah, let me look that up. No, I don't have a clue. I I am curious though. You know, you mentioned that the box that this comes in because it's a fancy leather box. Uh, are you gonna? If you bought this lens, would you keep the leather box or would you like pitch it? I mean, is it useful uh, in any form? No, I, I I would keep the box simply because it looks nice. And I'm showing the box right now for those who are watching the video. Uh, you might want to check out the video for this one because we've showed a lot of cool stuff. But uh, yeah, the box, I mean, it's sexy and it's interesting. And I do save packaging that is really cool. But I, what are you going to do with it? It's not like you're going to throw it in your camera bag. That box is just taking up extra needed space in your camera bag that you could be using for something else. Uh, I don't even box this up. This is just... Uh, floating freely in my lens bag here. So uh, I, I do have a, a little sleeve that it slides into, but you're not going to put a box in your bag, right? Right. Amen to that, bro. So I, I don't know. I just had to bring it up because if that's part of the marketing, it's a 
fancy leather box. Maybe maybe some people want to show it off because it's a 0 0.95 f-stop. Like, oh, this is awesome. Let me put it on my coffee table, right? I too, however, am a box keeper. My wife will tell you that it drives her crazy because I have boxes, every box known to man. And if you could see my floor right now, because I've I've been working on redoing the room, the shelving that used to have all my boxes, like the Canon boxes and the lenses, I've cleaned all those off and I'm going to put those down in the basement finally. But I'm definitely a box keeper like you are. But I would Yeah, it's it's kind of nice if you well, you look behind me here. I've got anything with a red stripe lens box behind me. I've got a few, like there's a 5D Mark III box up there in the corner and a 60 box somewhere on these shelves. I, I kind of like having them around, especially this, this is kind of a weird thing for me, but resale value of your lenses is actually about 40 to $75 higher if you maintain the original packaging. So uh, in general, I don't, I don't buy a lens with the intention of, of selling it again, but to hold onto the box is a very simple task in order to gain $75 in retail resale value out of a lens. If you ever do decide to get rid of it. Yep. And I'm not really sure why people pay that much more for a lens with the box. Maybe it's the whole getting to open the original packaging and seeing <laughs> inside. I'm not really 100% sure, but it's a thing. Definitely it, a thing. Well, and it, and it, I mean, if you go on eBay and you see somebody that's got the original packaging, you're like, oh, yeah. I want, that's I, true. I want that. I do. I would rather have the original packaging, which is why I save everything. I'm like you. I, I have boxes. <laughs> I mean, I have boxes in the basement from VHS uh, players and stuff. It's it's bad. I need to throw some of those away because, you know, the the device is gone now, but I still have the box. So... That's bad. <laughs> That's bad. VHS bad. players? Oh, Mitch, man. come on, man. I'm dating myself, aren't I? That's bad. All right, guys. On that note, I think we're about done for this early, early morning show. Mitch, do you have anything else you want to add before we get out of here? Um, I really want people to go back to last week's show and watch the tail end of that because I think I had another really awesome rant. <laughs> Uh, I don't think you included that in the audio version of the show. So those of you who are listening in audio, you, you really ought to tune into video if you can, uh, because we sometimes do a little bit of after show after the buttons get turned off. Uh, so anyway, I had a good rant. I don't think I have another good rant in me other than the one I already did with the uh, Panasonic GH4 and being ethical thing. And I don't think I really ranted on that too much. But anyway, long story short, we do sometimes. Moral from the story, don't shoplift, right? That's right. Absolutely true. And be ethical, people. Be ethical out there. While you're being ethical out there, Mitch, tell people where they can find you. I am at a Planet 5D. I can't even talk today. I'm sorry. I'm at a website called Planet5D.com. Also, you can find out all of the different toys that I have in work at my recently redesigned PlanetMitch.com. Uh, some of you have complained about a couple of things about Planet 5D's website, and I've fixed most of those. So I'm looking for feedback on everything. If you want to give me feedback, just email me at anything at planet5d.com will get to me. So thanks, TJ. I love having, having time to spend with you. You teach me something every week we have this show. So you people out there, tune in, rate the show on SoundCloud, on iTunes, and every other place you can go. Tell your friends about it because we have fun and it's awesome. And thanks for watching. On that, note, on that note, guys, you can find this podcast anywhere podcasts are distributed, including iTunes, SoundCloud, and so on. Push the like button because you like it. And also, you can find me over at DSLRFilmNoob.com. You can tweet at me at DSLRFilm. <laughs> I can't talk either today. This morning is just one of those mornings. I think I'm going to call it an end to episode 53 of the DSLR Film Noob Podcast. <laughs> And Mitch is dancing like a madman. He might have broke his headphones there. The battery's Watch flashing at me. Flashing, it's going out. Shimmy. Oh, nice. Fancy bows there, man. Fancy bows. 
Yeah, I like the noise canceling aspect of these things. Uh, it makes it very nice for me not to be able to hear screaming children in the background. <laughs> They uh they actually make me nauseous. Like I've I've used the noise canceling headphones a few times, and it kind of makes me feel weird. I, I haven't really gotten over it yet, so I'm not not 100 sure what the deal is with that. Uh, that is a, a common side effect. Uh, I've seen that talked about quite a bit. As a matter of fact, uh, you either like them or you don't. And some people, like they say, make them nauseous. They're great on an airplane, man. If you're traveling and you and you don't like the sound of those jet engines, woo wee. <laughs> yeah um I, I generally just plug i have those earmuffs that are giant uh industrial size uh ear hearing protection and inside yeah. they actually have headphones built into them so i'm that goofball that's like sitting on the plane with giant <laughs> giant headphones it's a style <laughs> choice guys. style what, choice trust me why doesn't that surprise me dj it doesn't surprise me at all <laughs> All right, guys, we're going to end the live broadcast now. Mitch, do you have anything else before we go? Uh, have a great week, you guys. Thanks for watching. I really appreciate everybody who tunes in. And if you tune in and tell a friend, you're even more awesome. And make sure you swing over to the planet5d.com to check out that uh, interview with uh, Chuck Westover. I got it right this time, not Westfall, Westover. No. Uh, no, Westfall. no, no. Oh. Dang it, I got it backwards again. West. Oh, oh. All right, well, I'm done. Fall. West fall, west fall, <laughs> fall, like fall down. I'm falling down and the show is falling down as well. Everybody have a great week. Bye.